Good afternoon, everybody. We're delight I'm delighted to be back. Um, there are just a couple of things I wanted to say before we start. First of all, believing in accuracy, I wanted to correct something I said yesterday that Ted White reminded me of. I attributed to whoever told Holmes that he, it was time for him to retire um, a quote which actually, which actually I had in the wrong time frame. It was, it, was, it was Hughes who went to tell Holmes the time had come for him to leave. He was beginning to lose it. And somebody else who went to see Stephen Field and uh, asked him if he hadn't had to do some, a duty something like this with somebody earlier, and it was Field who said, and a dirtier day's work I've never done. So uh, I just wanted to set the record straight on that. And I wanted to um, welcome you all back after, we hope, a nice lunch. And to introduce this panel, which is going to be on the culture wars, a very I, maybe modern phenomenon, and maybe not. I'm going to introduce the panelists. To my immediate left, Judge Michael McConnell, who I first got to know when he was a law professor at the University of Chicago, and then he went to the University of Utah, where he still teaches in addition to being a federal judge. He clerked for Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court. Um, let you not think that that makes him some sort of a liberal uh, law professor. Not so. And some when, sort of liberal law professor. Uh, and I mu must say one of the saddest days to me is when he went on the court, because he then couldn't do interviews with me for NPR, and they were always so interesting. And to his left is Heather Gerken, who clerked for Justice Souter and is now a professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, Yale Law School. Yeah, uh, sorry. Mm. Yale Law School. Woo, bad. Mm. I actually even knew that. I just screwed it up. Um, and immediately to her left is Michael Dorff, who clerked for Justice Kennedy and is a professor at NY, at Columbia Law School. I, <laughs> whoops. That was deliberate. I could have done a twofer. Um, I could have said that you were at Brigham Young. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Or on the Ninth Circuit. Or on the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> <laughs> or the Fourth. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to, this panel, everybody has assured me that they do not have opening remarks they wish to make. So there's nobody I have to cut off. Uh, so I'm going to just try to be uh, as unobtrusive a, a traffic cop as possible with a few basic questions. And my opening question to this panel is, when did the culture war start? Was it the Vietnam War? Was it Roe versus Wade? Was it the pill? Was it the draft? Um, was it, uh, you know, Something else, maybe it isn't really a 20th century phenomenon. Maybe the culture wars go back a great deal before that. So, um, Judge, why don't you start? <laughs> uh, Rank hath its privileges. I, I'm tempted to say the Garden of Eden, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, it, but at least the culture wars, wars uh, go back to the founding. I mean, if by culture we include issues of religion, for example, which I think are high on the list of of culture war issues, uh, uh, religion was uh, uh, w has been a contentious political matter from the beginning, including during the revolution itself, when uh, uh, when the leading apologists for the Tory position were almost without exception uh, Anglican ministers and the uh, Congregationalist and Presbyterian ministers and the Baptists led the revolutionary uh, cause, and then with the new government how they would, uh, the, the, uh, how secular the new government would be was one of the first debated issues for almost a month in Congress when they were uh, debating uh, the, the protocols for George Washington's inaugural. Uh, uh, this was uh, on the front burner and controversially they decided to include attendance at divine worship services as part of the first inaugural. George Washington's own contribution was to end the uh, constitutionally prescribed oath of office with the words, so help me God. Uh, that's not in the Constitution, but it has been uh, with us ever since. Uh, every president has had to, uh, to deal with that. To be sure, 
Some of our current culture war issues are pretty new, but that doesn't mean we haven't had them from the beginning. Heather? I actually think it's almost hardwired into the system that they're going to be culture wars involving the presidency and the court because there are two institutions that in some senses have to act. So the president has to make policy. Uh, the lower courts, at least, have to decide these questions. And once they do, it's hard for the Supreme Court to resist the impulse to go forward and decide them as well. They're capable of acting. So that in contrast to Congress, which is often subject to the problem of gridlock, both the presidency and, and the court are, are fairly nimble uh, in terms of moving things forward. And then also when they act, they speak. So they don't just render a decision, but they actually explain why they're rendering the decision. And I think that those three factors, in, in a sense, almost guarantee that the presidency and the court will at some point be involved in the issues that, are, that we're fighting about. It's almost impossible to avoid. Much as I'd like to disagree uh, for the sake of Your job is to disagree. Right. I, I, so I, I, I'll agree but disagree a little bit. That is, when we talk about the culture wars today, I think we have in mind a constellation of issues such as uh, abortion, gay rights, women's rights. We can't really talk about that because I was supposed to be on the previous panel, but we talk about that in the same way we talk about racial issues, uh, the role of religion in public life, uh, and then a whole set of free speech issues. And there are undoubtedly more. Uh, and um, some of those issues, especially race relations, have been with us from the founding. Others um, have be been controversial only in the last 70 years, 50 years, 30 years, 10 years in some of these cases. Uh, and uh, what I think distinguishes what I would call the modern period, say early 70s through today, from earlier periods is that these issues emerge as a matter of national politics to a much greater degree than in previous times. Now, maybe they're just replacing previous issues that were equally divisive and equally cultural in some sense. Uh, but I think it's nonetheless a useful category uh, in terms of how we think of how people vote, for example. So, you know, there's the, the claim of uh, some analysts that the coalitions of the two parties now are uh, divide along cultural issues rather than economic issues, which is the way they might have been divided uh, a generation earlier. Hmm. You know, uh, Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, they all got consequences from their appointments that they probably didn't bargain for. School prayer, limits on parochial school aid, uh, limits on the death penalty, the whole progression of birth control, leading to privacy uh, cases, um, the diminishing of rural power from one person, one vote. Um, do presidents, though, do they like these culture war issues? Do they use them to their advantage and therefore like them? Or do they dislike them? Do they just get in the way? They like them when they're, I mean, we can't lump them all together. They like them when they unite their party and get their supporters to the polls, and they dislike them when they divide their party and create em embarrassment. So uh, I just don't think we can lump them all together. But do they, is there ever a case where they really unite them? I mean, if you take the least freighted one now, if we look at, for example, at uh, reapportionment, <laughs> in each party there were people who liked it and people who hated it. I think one way to think about some of those issues is that the, this is actually from, drawn from Keith Whittington's new book, which is a one, I don't know if it's come out yet, but it's a wonderful book. And Whittington basically argues that presidents uh, love having courts around, particularly when they're trying to enforce a national agenda on a regional outlier. So the issues that you just described, so one person, one vote, no one in the federal government was really able to do anything about one person, one vote, the problems of malapportionment, except the court, because Congress depended upon those state legislators to draw their districts. And so, in some ways, the court sort of cut the Gordian knot on that question. Or um, think about the issues of race, uh, or even uh, Griswold versus Connecticut. So what's happening is the court as a national institution is sort of enforcing a norm that's growing nationally on regional outliers. It, maybe the religion cases could be understood that way too. It depends on how you think about it. But I think that's what gets the court into the culture wars. On the other hand, if I were, if you're a president, you can imagine why, assuming you're part of that national consensus, it would be awfully convenient to have the court doing your dirty work for you rather than having you do it for of it. Of course, sometimes the court 
Im imposes an outlier upon a national majority. Uh, you take you know Roe versus Wade, where at least 40, the laws of at least 45, and arguably all 50 states were uh, were overturned, or the more recent you know partial birth version, or even school prayer, which was quite widespread uh, at the time. Uh, so it's not always. Supreme Court's not always engaged in a mopping up operation. No, that's right. I just think that, that presidents are able to use the courts or to be, um, presidents I think have reasons not always to run against the court. Um, yeah. even, and even on the abortion case, I, it's hard for me to imagine that, that the abortion, having courts decide abortion decisions hasn't actually helped keep some coalitions together uh, at times when that fractious issue might divide them because presidents can always say, I'm pro-life, but uh, you know I'm, I believe in adhering to the law, and the court has to decide this question. It's a convenient way of keeping a coalition well, together. You know, I'm not a, a politician, but I think a lot of working politicos would say that, as a matter of practical party politics, Roe versus Wade has worked to the benefit of the Republican Party and to the detriment of the Democratic Party, notwithstanding the fact that right. the two parties tend to, in both cases, take the you know, take the position which is contrary to their to their partisan interests. Right, so, uh, so the Roe v. versus Wade helps to energize your base without you having to do anything about it to energize the other base. That's the benefit. But, but to come back to, to Nina's question, right, so that then the conventional wisdom then is you want to, uh, not as a president, but as a presidential uh, candidate, you want to mobilize your base by signaling to your base that you are going to be strong on that issue if you're a Republican candidate, that means you're going to appoint justices who will vote to overturn Roe. If you're a Democratic candidate, justices who will uh, uh, reaffirm it. Uh, but then try to soften that in the general election. So it's a complicated relation. Like culture wars, uh, war issues are useful for primary candidates. They're harmful for general election candidates who then have to try to soften their positions uh, on those. And aren't they always almost harmful for Supreme Court nominees because then they're stuck in a confirmation hearing trying to walk the tightrope? Uh, undoubtedly, that's true. <laughs> Sometimes lower court nominees. <laughs> Sometimes. Or as the Constitution so charmingly puts, just, uh, names them inferior court uh, <laughs> uh, nominees. <laughs> right, which has all sorts of spillover um, effects, right? So one, uh, uh, side effect of culture war issues making confirmation hearings more difficult is that you see fewer people uh, like Judge McConnell being nominated uh, because it's just not worth the effort to get uh, somebody with a, a paper trail through. Um, you know, or if you're going to name an academic, maybe you'll name an academic who uh, made his or her name in uh, antitrust or tax law or something that's thought not to be quite as fraught. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering, uh Presidents have always had some thing that they really cared about in terms of Supreme Court nominees. Mm -hmm. FDR wanted to make sure that his nom he picked people for the court who would uphold the New Deal legislation, for example. I don't think he really thought particularly about civil rights or civil liberties or any of those other things. I, I think President Reagan, at least as far as I can tell, and you guys are much smarter than I am, but as far as I could tell, was the first president, and his successor Republican presidents have carried that forward even further, who had a very elaborate agenda of things, more than just law and order, more than just abortion, also executive power questions, federalism questions, a whole lot of everything. Can that survive? Can that kind of all-encompassing criteria criterion, and then for all these different issues, can that survive without really hurting the, the, the Supreme Court, the confirmation process, and the presidency? Or is it the way of the future? See, I'm not sure that I accept the historical uh, premise. I think that the New Dealers had just as comprehensive a uh, a, a, a set of constitutional principles as the as the Reaganites did. I do think that in between that there's some administrations that are not particularly concerned, but those two I think were. Now in both cases, you can't think about everything. And so, uh, you know, Felix Frankfurter turns out to be, you know, a, a, a new dealer with respect to the issues that are on the front burner and becomes, looks like a bit of a conservative by the time 
uh, the, the new issues of the Warren Court uh, come about. Uh, and I don't think that the New Dealers had thought all of that through, but you could say exactly the same thing about uh, Reaganite judges, that yes, they had certain things they were looking at that looked pretty comprehensive, but 20 years later, those people are deciding the issues of their day and on, in unpredictable ways. And, you know, and, and so you have you know, quite libertarian-leaning judges uh, named by uh, uh, President Reagan, and you have quite, uh, uh, you know, judicial restraint types that will uphold whatever the government does, also appointed by Reagan. They don't look very similar today. I want to disagree strongly with that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and, and although I didn't make an opening statement, I'm now going to, in 30 seconds, describe the thesis of a recent Law Review article of mine. I'm going to lead you, read you a list. Oh, goody, of, that means I don't have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read you a list of 12 Republican justices. These are all the justices appointed by Republican presidents since President Nixon. I'm going to divide them into two lists. Here's the first list. Berger, Rehnquist, Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, Alito. Here's the second list. Powell, Blackman, Stevens, O'Connor, Kennedy, Souter. Uh, the difference between the two lists, everybody on the first list had federal executive branch experience before going on the Supreme Court. Nobody on the second list did. Uh, what that tells me, at least, is that uh, federal executive branch experience is a way of identifying for Republican presidents, at least over the last uh, 40 some odd years, those people who, when they become justices, are going to be more or less loyal to whatever the Republican uh, uh, ideology is. And we could do the same thing for Democrats, it's just there are only two of them. Um, the, the, my, and, and, my, and I, of course, I agree with Judge McConnell that there will be issues that you can't predict that arise anew. But in an era when parties are more ideologically coherent in the United States than they've been uh, in a very long time, I think there will continue to be a lot of coherence uh, between sort of conservatives on the one side and uh, moderates and liberals on the other. My very interesting list, since the first name on the list was Warren Berger, who was the author of Lemon versus Kurtzman, the, you know, the strongest separationist opinion and, and uh, establishment clause. He went along with, uh, he, he was in the majority in Roe versus Wade. He was the author of, uh, of the first uh, uh, mandatory busing for desegregation uh, decision. That's true. He, he's, he's, uh, I'm, he, he's less conservative by modern standards, but if you look at the statistical analyses of the, the voting pattern of the patterns of the justices under the, the so-called attitudinal model, uh, he <laughs> codes quite conservative uh, and, and certainly more conservative than any of the contemporaries on the second column uh, that served with him. But I agree that by modern standards, there are issues in which he's an outlier. Well, if we look at sort of the, icon the iconic case of the conservatives view as judicial activism and it's the, the lightning rod case of all the confirmation hearings, it's Roe versus Wade. And um, I wasn't around at the time of Griswold covering the court. I was there when Roe was decided. And it really wasn't nearly as unpopular on the day it was decided as it probably is today or was five years ago. It wasn't that big a deal. It didn't become a national issue in a in a national election until seven years later. And maybe I'm wrong about this because there now is an effort by some to uh, make contraceptives not available or at least make them uh, rec rec make restrictive laws involving, in, involving contraceptives. But I still have the impression that Griswold, while law professors didn't like it, they saw it as a a penumbra activist opinion. Um, its predecessor, Poe versus Ullman, was, is still considered very interesting, good law, and, and that Griswold isn't enormously unpopular as, as a general matter compared to Roe. So what was the transformation? How did that happen? How did we get from it not being such a big deal to being a very big deal? Well, one thing to notice is that at the time Griswold was decided, uh, Connecticut was, I think, the only remaining state that made uh, the use of contraceptives by married couples uh, illegal. So the rest of the country had already adopted this. And so whatever one might think of the, of the uh, rather extravagant uh, majority opinion, 
uh, in the case, which you know I think law professors still poke fun at uh, uh, regularly, whether they like the result or not. Uh, whatever you think of the reasoning of it, it was not a remarkable decision in terms of, of the actual social policy uh, reflected. Roe versus Wade, quite, um, uh, quite the contrary, that uh, uh, the, uh, it, uh, Roe might have been much less so had it been less ambitious, but, the, uh, uh, but the, uh, had it confined itself to the rather to the, to the details of the Texas uh, uh, statute, but having gone as sweepingly as it did, it, it made a major change. Uh, and then, uh, and so I, I, you are, I, I think, right that, uh, that, it, that the controversiality of that sort of slowly dawned uh, on, on people. Part of that is a religious cultural story because uh, uh, abortion had not been much debated in religious circles at a time when it was illegal almost everywhere and, 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 and it looked like a Catholic-Protestant divide and Protestants, I think, when the decision first came down, tended to think, oh, well, this is fine because only Catholics care about that. Uh, and then as, the, as abortion became more, uh, uh, more a part of our national life, you had major Protestant leaders like uh, Francis Schaeffer uh, who energized uh, the Protestant uh, groups and especially the more evangelical uh, side of Protestantism. And, and pretty soon it became uh, a point of union between uh, evangelicals and Catholics rather than a point of difference between them. Uh, and you know, seven years is not that long for that to have taken place. Does any of it have to do with actually, this thought just occurred to me, um, the place of Catholics in America in the early 1970s and before. In other words, when Justice Brennan, for example, was named to the court, he was asked very specific, and we would today say probably politically incorrect questions about whether he could be a neutral justice, a fair justice, despite his Catholicism. Of course, today there are five Catholics on the court. but um, and. And just as President Kennedy, when he was candidate Kennedy, had to assure the Baptist ministers that he would not be beholden to the Pope, for example, that, that there was some notion of separateness between religion and the court, that today it's not that justices are dictated to by any religious figure or even by their religion per se, but that it's much more acceptable to consider that the law is also has some moral questions that need to be resolved somewhat in the context of religion. Where am I crazy? So, so, so you know there's this, this wonderful book, How the Irish Became White. I think someone should write a book called How Catholics and Jews Became Judeo-Christians, uh, right? Be, um, and you're free to use the title uh, if you do, right? I mean, it, not only are there five Catholics in the Supreme Court, there are only two Protestants, right? On, on you know, which is a remarkable fact given American history. It's because um, the religion, in the sense of what mainstream sect one belongs to, is no longer a major cleavage in American politics uh, in the way that it once was. There, the, there's a much more substantial cleavage between people who are religious at all or not religious. But you know, whether someone is uh, uh, any particular Protestant sect or Catholic or Jewish doesn't, isn't really politically salient for the most part. It's interesting. So Jeff Stone actually um, caused a little bit of a stir among law professors by writing a column about, uh, about the fact that there are five Catholics. And the reaction was, uh, was mostly sort of what Michael would have, would have predicted, that is mostly people thought it didn't really matter that much. And some people, in contrast to Brennan, it was definitely, I think, looked on as sort of this is not an appropriate way of framing the justices. So for example, during Bush v. Gore and, and uh, almost every political question ever since, every time you see a judge's uh, affiliation, a judge listed on a program, often listed as an affiliation or who nominated that judge. So it's very, the partisan divide is quite salient and people feel like that is a predictor. Um, but they don't, I think that's right, that they don't think of Catholicism or religion as an, as, as an obvious predictor the way they, and they don't feel as comfortable talking about it as they do with partisanship. 
Well, they may not feel as comfortable about it, but I do think it's come forward as a as something that people do consider to be a major predictor. I don't. I but don't but not but not Catholic versus um, you know yeah. Baptist or. or um, no, but I think you know what kind of Catholic you mm -hmm. are and what kind of Baptist you are uh, uh, does does make a difference. I was once, uh, be, in, be, before being on the court, I was uh, at a meeting at the, uh, if Juan Williams can, can, uh, can drop names, can I yes, say, so can with, with, with President Clinton about, uh, <laughs> about uh, enforcement of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and there were, uh, I was uh, the, sort of the legal person there, and there were several, there were representatives of a number of denominations there, including two Baptists, and uh, one of them rather a conservative Baptist and one quite a liberal Baptist, and they introduced themselves to the president saying, one of us is a good Baptist and one of us is a bad Baptist. <laughs> we're not telling you which ones are which. So, but, but these things are, uh, I, I think, are, are markers. And, one other point that I think, thinking about the court, when I was a law clerk, which was in the, uh, which was in 1980, we would also go around and talk uh, to, we would have lunch with the other justices, and and, and I was curious about their religious uh, uh, interests, and I believe that at most one member of the court at that time uh, had any kind of regular uh, worship attendance. Uh, it was. I mean, they had nominal affiliations, but I think at most one justice would be in church or synagogue or, or certainly not mosque, uh, um, you know, on, more than, you know, on, on a high holy day. And uh, today, I believe that six or seven of them are regular uh, uh, attenders. That means we have a court that is not only much less Protestant, than ever before, but also a court that's much more religiously engaged than at least uh, uh, when I was a youngster, which I think is kind of interesting. It is interesting. Um, one of uh, our audience asks whether the controversy over Roe versus Wade related to the rise of feminism and the changing role of women, and whether the pro-life movement is somehow a uh, code for, and this is, uh, again, the questioner's term, uh, keeping women in the home. It depends, right? <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine that there are any, you know, pro-life activists who would uh, describe themselves as doing that, nor believe that that's what they're doing. Um, so, right, I mean, part of the art of politics, whether presidential politics or any other level, is defining your opposition. So if you believe strongly that women should have a constitutional right to abortion, you know, it's to your advantage to portray people who believe the opposite as not really caring about the life of the unborn, but really wanting to keep women in the home. And the pushback actually has been interesting, as is obvious from the m most recent abortion case. That is, the pushback has been to recast the pro-life agenda is one for about protecting women, not just protecting the fetus. And that clearly seeped into the Supreme Court's most recent abortion decision, um, to the outrage of some and to the delight of others. But it, it, the shifting ground has been one of the sort of things that makes it difficult to generalize. And it, one of the things I think is most unfortunate about our current political culture is the extent to which people are very quick to ascribe either evil motives or stupidity to people who happen to disagree mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for people who favor abortion rights to, to try to understand why others don't share that view and vice versa. There was an excellent book, I think the author was Faye Ginsburg, about the, um, who was a sociologist who looked at the abortion wars, if you will, in, in Wichita, Kansas, which for some reason is a particular hotbed for uh, because demonstrations they do, because and Because they do third trimester abortions there. Um, in any event, she, she went and she did series of interviews with uh, activists on both sides. And among the things, it's been a while since I read this book, but I remember one of her conclusions was that 
uh, the most dedicated activists on both sides tended to be women, and that they, uh, and that the pro-life women had a type of feminism, not an anti-feminism, but a type of feminism, uh, just as the uh, the pro-choice uh, women did. And I thought this was an extremely interesting, called Contested, I can't remember the name of the book, Contested Something, I think was the title. It, actually, <laughs> I, I first noticed this in decades ago when I was in Iowa covering some Republican <laughs> presidential primary thing or other, and there was, and I spent a couple of days with um, a lovely, very smart woman who was a pro-life activist, and there, for my money, there really wasn't much difference between her and the pro-choice activist, except the core issue that they were fighting about, and they were both incredibly dedicated to what they were doing and very creative and inventive about how they were going to do it. Um, some, one of our uh, audience also says, are the culture wars really new? What about the mobocracy of Adams and Jefferson period, the Jacksonian democracy, manifest de destiny and the white man's burden, prohibition and the great experiment in know-nothingism? Uh, aren't those all, weren't those all culture wars too? Sure. But we, we, I'm, not, I'm not sure what this category means exactly. I mean, it's sort of convenient to, to lump various issues together, but what, what really is a culture war issue? I, I assume it means one which, in which there are, why, that there's some sort of moral or cultural difference and, and, and that they're very controversial, but those, you know, that describes a whole lot of things. Certainly, the fight over slavery was an enormous culture war issue, even if it was also a civil rights issue. And, and Jim Crow was an enormous culture war issue, even though it was also a civil rights issue. I would say, you know, abortion, gay rights, religion, these are culture, you know, and culture war issues. They are also uh, civil rights issues. Thinking legally about this, I think it's an extremely unhelpful category because it cuts across uh, the question of, of constitutional theory and, and especially it lumps in some of these issues are ones that the Constitution directly addresses and some are issues that the Constitution does not uh, directly address. So I don't see, when we think about the court's involvement in these issues, there is no way that a court faced with the First Amendment can avoid free speech and freedom of religion issues. Right? But as to some of these issues, same-sex marriage, abortion, um, assisted suicide, just to name a few, uh, there's nothing obviously in the Constitution about them. The court need not have gotten uh, uh, involved in those issues, and it's, a, it's kind of a matter of choice uh, 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 for the court, but some culture war issues are really at the heart of the actual constitution as in, you know, <laughs> the document that, with words uh, in it, and, and the court is necessarily going to be involved in that. So trust the first law professor to disagree with, to counter the hypothetical and the second one to disagree. I, I think it's a useful category for at least one reason, which is it, it raises this question about how self-conscious the court should be about running into political questions of various sorts. So call them cultural, call them political, whatever they are, they're controversial. And whether or not you think that the court has to address, for example, the question of gay rights, when they address it, the, I think the harder question is how do they think about it? So one of the interesting things about one of the justices, Justice Scalia, is that he puts the culture wars on the table in his dissent. So he accuses the court of intervening in the culture wars. He has a macro, I think, in his computer so that every time he has a case about gay rights, this little macro spits out a bunch of words about bestiality and masturbation and pornography. And you know, so he immediately pulls in. Polygamy. Uh, Don't forget polygamy. polygamy. Oh, yes, I forgot polygamy. Uh, but he immediately pulls in all of these questions of, of extreme salience, uh, even though what he is nominally addressing at that moment is a different question. Uh, and so the question is, is Justice Scalia doing the right thing? So when he writes his dissent and he invokes the culture wars and he sort of offers what is, is in some sense uh, addressed as much beyond lawyers as it is to lawyers, 
Is that the way the justice should think about it? Should they not think about it at all in their role as a judge? Or they, should they be aware that when they are deciding these cases, they are intervening in one direction or another in the culture wars and try to think about the consequences? If, if we can think about it in terms of, sort of presidential politics, um, I, I, I want to agree with Heather that, that this is potentially a useful framing for the following reason. Right? The Roosevelt New Deal coalition uh, consists of northern liberals, Dixiecrats, right, um, African Americans. You've got you've got people um, who today get driven apart. Now, why were they together during the New Deal and you know until basically the 19, 1968 election? That it's conventionally thought to be the reason that it falls apart because economic issues are thought to be the primary driver of national politics. It's only when uh, issues of first race and then all these other things that we're calling cultural wars but are, but are not pure pocketbook issues become nationally salient and more nationally salient than economic issues in some ways, notwithstanding President Clinton's it's the economy stupid. Right? Uh, it's only when those issues become nationally salient that uh, national politics now turns to some extent on culture war issues. And as you said earlier, and those issues are bubbling up to the Supreme Court. And, and you know, I, I don't think the Supreme Court has ever been able to avoid these sorts of questions, right? It may be that there's, uh, there's a textual hook for them staying out, but even then, there's something they're going to be in on, right? So they're going to be in on equal protection, right? Justice Black, who is, you know, a great believer in, uh, also a Pointed by President Roosevelt, our great believer in you know the text of the Constitution, um, he gets embroiled in these questions because he has views on the stuff they can't avoid, like the First Amendment, like the Equal Protection Clause. It's really and interesting when you look at the polling data in presidential elections or even big congressional election years, that culture war issues become very salient. They become dominating issues when the economy is okay and we're not at war. You get yourself a hot terrorist attack or a, um, a real live severe recession and, they, and those issues tend to recede. They come back, always, but they do recede. Uh, I heard David Frum uh, last week, who's now signed on for the Giuliani campaign, um, say that national security is a moral issue, right, using moral issue in the way that we're using sort of culture war issue, uh, as a way of explaining why uh, Rudolf Giuliani is appealing to voters who might not share his views um, as a matter of sort of legislative preference on culture war issues. Now, it's true he's sort of softening those positions by saying that's not going to affect how he'll appoint justices and judges and so forth. Uh, but um, I, I think the fact that uh, from, and I assume therefore the Giuliani campaign. I'm wants Pat to, Robertson. Right, w right, of course, wants to frame national security as a moral issue suggests that even, you know, with the, the dominance you'd expect national security and economic issues to play, there's still value to framing things as, as moral slash cultural war issues. Well, but I still think it's um, we can distinguish between some of these some of these things. Take take the difference between freedom of speech on the one hand and I don't know same sex marriage on the other. Uh, when the court is active with respect to freedom of speech, it is not p taking sides in the culture war in the same way that it is on say the same sex uh, marriage issue because. Everyone has the interest in freedom of speech. One day it may be, you know, pro-life marchers uh, uh, walking down the street. The next day it may be uh, uh, anti-war uh, uh, marchers, and the and a vigorous protection for freedom of speech therefore cuts in various different ways. Right? It's not. It, it's not. Uh, uh, it's not really taking uh, uh, taking sides. At any one point in time, say at the height of the Vietnam War, where you have a particular set of issues, it may temporarily appear that way. But over the over time, you know, f uh, freedom of speech, it seems to me, is not a, 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 a taking of sides, but but rather is a way of maintaining governmental neutrality with respect to uh, to culture war uh, issues. When the court is asked to decide something like, shall we have the right to same-sex marriage or to assisted suicide or whatever, it is being asked to become 
a decision maker on one side or another of the culture wars questions. They, of course, do that from time to time, although I thought the court was very wise with respect to assisted suicide in not taking the bait. Right? I think they would have been wise not to take the bait uh, at, at the time of Roe versus Wade as well. Uh, so they do sometimes do it. They sometimes uh, uh, refrain. But when they do it, they make themselves um, more partisan, more controversial uh, in a way which they don't when they do uh, when they're engaged in other kinds of, and free speech isn't the only example of where the, an activism of the court is not necessarily partisan. One person, one vote also has you know, various uh, ramifications uh, uh, politically. For protecting freedom of religion has various ramifications across the culture wars, whether you're talking about the right of Native Americans to ingest peyote or whether you're talking about the... Uh, uh, the, the right of a parent to, uh, to, to, to have greater control over the education of their child. These things cut various different, uh, different ways. If the court isn't self-conscious about avoiding the more partisan side of this, I think it should be. I, can I, can I, you can I disagree with yeah. you? Yeah, I'll, I'll disagree with everything that he says that you don't disagree with. Okay. <laughs> so, are, are you all going to divide it up ahead right. of time? Or? So I think that... The, that what you just articulated is, is highly dependent on a particular view of the Constitution and a particular view of what judges do. So for example, just to return to the question of gay marriage, you could portray that as taking a side in the culture war, or you could portray it as part of the grand tradition of the court in protecting minorities, or you could portray it as an effort to help everyone we all want to marry. Uh, maybe um, this is just sort of something that acro cuts across everyone, it cuts for some and not others at different points. Oh, you're not serious just, about or, that. Or you no, can frame it at the level of generality <laughs> of protecting fundamental decisions like about liberty. family life. So, so yeah. for example, only, the right, by, to, the right to home by, educate your kids. Only by penumbrating into the uh, uh, but there's a different atmosphere question. And there's a different question with a high into... level of generality, can you possibly say that? So no right to home education of your children. I'm sorry, what? There's no right to home education of your children under Meyer and Pierce? There has never been a single constitutional case in any state of the union upholding a constitutional right to homeschool your children. And you think that people who are on it the has religious been, it right was achieved, side of the culture it was an wars not It was an enormous that? social transformation that was achieved entirely through a grassroots political movement. And, and, and it's it, stronger by virtue of that. Had the homeschoolers, when the first issue ever came up, you know, 25 years ago, gone and gotten the Supreme Court to give them the right to do that, I think it would be a controversial question today. But instead, they did it the slow political route, and it is not particularly controversial today. But Judge McConnell, can we today? just separate the, there's right. two questions here. There's a the question of the issue, and there's a the question of the methodology. So on gay rights, there are two ways to decide the right to marriage question. One is to say, as you say, define liberty at a certain level of generality and, and argue that the right goes across everyone. Or you could do it under conventional equal protection analysis. Now, you may think that conventional equal protection analysis shouldn't apply to gays and lesbians, um, or you may not. But it's not that hard to imagine the court in its long tradition doing that in a doctrinally respectable fashion. So again, going to Roe v. Wade, the problem with Roe v. Wade may be that it was a culture war issue, or it may be that the court used a set of judicial tools that not even liberals uh, can respect them for using. So there's two sets of questions here about what courts should do. And, and it may be that as long as courts are doing what courts do and what they do well, then intervening in the culture war issues is actually some, is part of their job. I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, it may very well be that a judge, a justice of the Supreme Court says, I really don't wish we could avoid getting into this. I think it's going to be 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 more It's going to be a lot of trouble. I, I, but the legal materials drive me to the conclusion, and I'm going to do it uh, anyway. And it, you know, for all I know, uh, you know, uh, same-sex marriage could be such a thing. I'm not arguing the uh, the uh, the legal doctrine of it. I'm saying that they ought to be leery of doing it when they don't have to. That, uh, that to be able to leave issues of this sort to a decentralized state-by-state -state political process has enormous institutional advantages, not just for the court, but for the country as a whole 
and for democracy, small d, uh, a democracy. And and I, I, I think that when they are driven, when the constitutional materials force them, fine. But uh, let's not be leaping unnecessarily into these things when the constitutional materials don't force us to do it. So here's a, here, Tocqueville notices in the 19th century, right, that in America everything eventually becomes a constitutional question for the courts, or at least a legal question. Uh, and part of the reason we have that problem, and I agree it's, as a matter of sort of legal strategy that that can be problematic, but part of the reason we have that problem is because we have a decentralized legal system uh, in which the Supreme Court speaks last, and national movements of, and organizations don't get to control what cases are brought. I do a lot of work consulting with various civil rights organizations on what cases to bring, and they are uh, routinely terrified of the following scenario that comes to fruition. So say I'm working with some gay rights organization, which decides for much of the reasons that Judge McConnell points out, this is not the time to push a same-sex marriage case to the U.S. Supreme Court because the court's not uh, best suited for it, the, the country isn't ready for it, it'll inspire backlash, and then lo and, lo and behold, somebody who doesn't really care about the national political agenda but just wants to get married brings one of their cases somewhere with, one, with some lawyer they've hired out of the phone book. Uh, and that person has a right to take their case up, up the chain, and, and so there's a different question for what the people in the movement should be doing versus what the judges and justices should be doing once they get the case. So what I take it what you're arguing for is a kind of, you know, version of the passive virtues don't decide cases unnecessarily, don't reach out. Um, and the problem, I think, is that they, they, these cases are sometimes thrust upon them, uh, even though people in the respective social movements don't necessarily want to do it either. And just to, I mean, I, I just, I think we were talking about Lawrence based upon your reference to defining liberty at a high level of generality. So Lawrence versus Texas is the most recent gay rights decision to come down where the court overruled Bowers versus Hardwick, which was a case decided not too long ago. 1986. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and what the court said in Lawrence is, in essence, it, it was a prohibition against sodomy in Texas, and they overturned it. And what they said was, in essence, that gays and lesbians, uh, actually all people, have a certain right to privacy. Now, the question is, what should the court have done in Lawrence? One read of it would be to say, this is a culture war issue. That's what Justice Scalia said. The court shouldn't reach out and grab on to this question of gay rights. We have to settle it in a democratic way. It would be better for everyone if we just let the decision go out. On the other hand, as a student of elections, I wonder how exactly is it that you settle an issue in a democratic system where some part of the subpopulation is, it can actually be, go to jail um, or be discriminated against in all sorts of ways because of an existing law? Or more broadly, um, how can some part of the subpopulation compete in the democratic system when there's when stigma exists and that stigma is embodied into a legal system? So, I find these well, questions harder than than the. I mean, the, the answer is, the answer is that this movement is in fact very politically powerful, and over the and in, in the early 1960s, uh, every state in the union. I uh, made uh, homosexual sodomy a crime, and many of them were enforcing it. By the time of Bowers versus Hardwick, it had flipped to, I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like 27 states. It, it was then legal, and no one was really enforcing it. By Lawrence, there are a few more, and you know, again, I'm no practical politician, but I can read the polls, and the, if you look at the age, if you look at the uh, uh, polling data on, uh, on attitudes toward homosexuality divided by age, uh, you see that uh, this is an issue which is going to be a non-issue. I'm not speaking normatively here, but just as a matter of of uh, looking at the at the polling data, this is going to be a non-issue uh, real fast. And uh, and it, so you know maybe maybe Lawrence was properly decided on the basis of the legal materials. The, Maybe there's something in the text of the Constitution that points that way. Maybe there were some precedents other than Bowers versus Hardwick pointing that way. But let's just hypothesize for a moment that it really didn't make much sense as a matter of legal doctrine, right? So the Supreme Court took it upon itself to resolve something that was going to be resolved politically pretty fast anyway, and at a cost in terms of now taking upon the court taking upon themselves uh, yet again this um, hubristic notion 
that they are the ones who get to decide contended um, uh, moral questions uh, for the American people. So right, but it's only hubristic if we assume that it's wrongly decided, right? Of course, it's, of course they shouldn't do it if they think it oh, comes maybe, out the other way. I'm saying maybe it's right, maybe they're right morally. Right. No, no, I mean as a matter of legal but, doctrine. Uh, it's hu yeah, I agree with sure, it. I agree sure. that it's hubristic to take a case absolutely. and decide it the wrong but way as a matter of absolutely. legal doctrine. Absolutely, but I, I think that uh, if you took a poll of people who agree with the result in Lawrence versus Texas and you ask them, how impressed are you with the legal reasoning and you guarantee them anonymity, that it will not uh, get a very resounding. I'm not sure. Of Justice true. Kennedy's opinion or the opinion that they, they themselves are going to get to write? I'm talking about Justice Kennedy's opinion. <laughs> but let me just say here I, or, that an That was your year, I think. No, no, that was, I, I'm much No, he was that. long gone. Oh. An interesting thing, though, happened in Lawrence, and I'd like oh, to make Casey. a couple of sort of historical observations about this and get you guys to talk about it a bit. The first is that when Lawrence was decided in whatever it was, 2001, 2003, I don't remember. That was the Texas case where these two guys, a cop walks into a, an apartment because uh, the door was unlocked to serve some, I don't know, traffic warrant, I can't remember, finds two guys engaged Actually, in- Actually, those are the facts of Bowers against Hartlock. No, it was also the facts in- Where they blunder back into the- Yeah, it was also the facts in Texas. Seems and the, the guy happening. actually spent a night in jail. Uh, one of the guys, or both of them, spent a night in jail. Um, unlike, I think they never did in Bowers, but I don't remember. But it doesn't matter. Uh, so the question, the court says, and I think that Texas and maybe there was one or two, uh, one or two other states left that still made this a criminal offense to have private, consensual, homosexual relations. And the court invalidated the statute in large measure, at least on paper, because the state couldn't come up with a compelling reason to have the law. Now, just whatever number of years, 15 years earlier, 16 years earlier, the court had decided Bowers versus Hardwick and come to the opposite conclusion. And whatever you think of these two decisions, whether you like them or hate them, or are somewhere in between, the fact is, and I was not smart enough to bring you some of the language from those from the Bowers opinion, the 1986 opinion. The language used in Justice White's opinion and Justice, Chief Justice Berger's concurring opinion is language that would be barred in most workplaces today, that would get you fired if you used, if you made those kind of comments to people about the way they conducted their lives. Um, you would be fired. It is not politically correct. It is unacceptable. You can think it, but you may not say it. You could go out and you can campaign against gay marriage easily, but you cannot engage in that kind of uh, conversation, really, about a gay lifestyle, for want of a better expression. So in, the, in, a, in a space of 16 years, the whole tone of the country changed. And I think having watched it, that it changed a little bit because, because the court reached a decision that was already behind the times when it, was, when it was rendered. I don't know how it would have done better, but it might have done better to reach the same conclusion with different language. And I don't know how that happened. I remember the first time somebody called me and asked me, what did I, in my workplace, what did I think about the possibility of gay marriage? And I thought they were out of their cotton-picking minds. I never heard of such a crazy idea. And now, if you ask your 30-year-old, your 30-year-old conservative Republican or 28-year-old grad student, they likely don't think this is an issue for them. It's just not an issue. We've, it's just a very different, place we're in, and I'm not quite sure how it happened, but I do know that Lawrence got cubed, as it were, because right afterwards, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court decided that the state laws against gay marriage were violated the state constitution, as, as well as for the federal constitution, but for, the, for all practical purposes, the state constitution. And then, in, in the body politics mind, the whole thing somehow got merged into one. 
So I toss that out for what it's worth. I'm not sure I have a question. I mean, it, it, it's clear that this is a, a, a remarkable and extremely rapid social transformation. It's, it's uh, not the only one we've had, but it is, uh, it's, uh, it's remarkable. And the Supreme Court was not leading it, right? Uh, uh, it, it happened anyway. Uh, I think uh, it might, might be a hint that uh, we don't really have to, we don't really have to have the Supreme Court telling us uh, what to do as a people. It's, uh, we can sometimes do it on our own. So I'm not in disagreement with that, although I'll just say two things. One is, uh, when the Supreme Court read Lawrence, so they had this moment at the court, it's called the hand down, and when the justices read the opinion, every lawyer knew that that's when, that the day that Lawrence was going to be handed down, and there were people weeping. Lawyer, Supreme Court bar is not, you know, is not known as sort of a warm and fuzzy group. Uh, they're extremely able practitioners. They were weeping as the decision was being handed down, and the reason they were weeping, I think, was because Bowers was, just as Cudity said it was, a stigma that the Supreme Court had perpetuated. And that by overturning that decision and calling it a stigma while colleagues of his on the bench who had joined that opinion were still sitting, I thought was remarkable. So one question is, if, this, if the world is moving, should the court catch up with it? I agree that it doesn't have to be the leader. Uh, but also I think that it's a mistake to say, just because we've seen it move quickly, that that means that somehow uh, everything is only pointing in one direction. So in the wake of the Massachusetts, we have some people in here who know this uh, stuff very well, but in the wake of the Massachusetts decision, um, you could notice two things. You could notice in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was, on the day that the licenses started being issued and uh, gays and lesbians started to get married, uh, there was no rioting in the street. There wasn't any massive protests of people being bussed in, because Cambridge, needless to say, doesn't have that many people against the issue. But people were you know, so riled up about it that they decided to go protest in Cambridge. On the other hand, in the next election, we saw a bunch of initiatives that were being put on the ballot in response to this. Um, and I don't think if you talk to gays and lesbians in those states that they would uh, particularly feel like everything is moving in the right direction and this is easy. I mean, so I, I said my worry is, uh, you know, in the days of the, whenever you talk to someone who was in the middle of the civil rights movement, you got the feeling that every day it was incredibly tenuous. They had no idea which direction things were going, and it mattered what the court did, even if it only mattered symbolically. It mattered. But sometimes the court, I mean, uh, generates a, a backlash and may actually make the make it harder to move in that direction. And also, I'd like just to point out, sometimes the American people are not persuaded by. Uh, uh, by the court. Uh, uh, Nina was saying, you know, when Roe versus Wade came out, it was not particularly uh, controversial. Well, I have news, it's very controversial now. And if you look at that same sort of age-based uh, uh, polling data, you'll find that the younger cohorts are slightly less supportive of, uh, of abortion rights than the not than the very oldest, but than the than the than our age uh, uh, the cohort. The middling oldest. We're the we're the strong <laughs> we're the strong uh, uh, pro-choice uh, cohort uh, uh, on on this end of the of the uh, yeah, uh, those panel. Are, those are the children. Uh, <laughs> the, the, but the point is, so the Supreme Court's going to be right sometimes. The Supreme Court's going to be wrong sometimes. I'd like to say a word for the idea that important moral issues deserve widespread debate. I think federalism is a great system for issues of this sort where we don't have to have one national answer. And, and it can be debated in New York, it can be debated in Utah. People might come to different answers and we can learn from one another. We can see the experience. I think, for example, of the uh, assisted suicide uh, experiment going on in Oregon. Now, I'm not in favor of assisted suicide, but I think to the fact that a state is doing this and we can find out whether some of the unfortunate consequences that I would predict are in fact going to, going to take place, that's a good thing. I think it's good that we have a voucher experiment going on in Cleveland. I think to have um, that, that federalism, which gives an opportunity for different answers, for experience, for widespread debate, not just some lawyers in front of nine other lawyers uh, at one time 
uh, one, one time fits all decision making uh, uh, like we get in the Supreme Court. I think it's just a better way for a free people to go about deciding important questions. And in the wake of Supreme Court decisions upholding the New Deal, you're not going to get it because these issues have become nationalized in Congress as well. So the most recent abortion case is the federal partial birth abortion you know, but ban I think, act. But I think that proves the point because if, if the Supreme Court had not been as aggressive back at the first one in Stenberg versus Carhartt when they hold that the state partial birth abortion uh, uh, law is unconstitutional, if they had held back, there never would have been a national law. I think the national law is, uh, it seems to me it's a situation nobody really should want. Yeah, I, Wouldn't it have been better if they had said to themselves, look, this is, a, this is a proposition that even most people who support abortion rights seem to think that partial birth abortion crosses some kind of very difficult to define line. Not everyone, but large numbers of supporters of abortion rights think this. Let's let this go and we can at least see uh, uh, how it progresses. But instead, no, five justices in a 5-4 decision say, you can't do that, and then now, we're, now we have a national law. Well, I, I, I don't want to litigate the merits of the decision, but I, I, I do want to, I mean, neither of us can prove it because we can't run the world backwards and then see how it happens in the, in the other, con other way, but I do think that there are very few sincere politicians anymore who will say, I think that I, uh, my position is X. Uh, but I'm going to vote against X in Congress because I think it should be decided at the at the state level. So you know, the one person who's sort of campaigning for president on this platform uh, on on, an, on a culture war issue is John McCain, right? And he's taking a lot of heat for it, right? He says he's against a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage because he thinks it should be decided on a, on a state by state level. And more generally, he's supportive of of you know uh, leaving things at, at the state level. Uh, you forgot a, you forgot Vice President Cheney. He said that too. Right, but he's not running for anything anymore no. now. Um, and he said it quietly when he when he was running for vice president. But my my point is only that I think the the period in which culture war issues could be left to the states if only the Supreme Court didn't meddle uh, is gone because federalism is something that politicians invoke when it happens to suit their uh, particular ideological position. I, I wish that were, were not true, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but. Uh, that's that's how I you know you see it you see it not only on uh, partial birth abortion you saw it on assisted suicide right that at the um, the the Ashcroft Justice Department tried to nationalize this <laughs> and and did not succeed on administrative now, law if the, grounds. If the people of the United States want to nationalize it and if it falls within an enumerated power of Congress, well, and and doesn't violate any. You know, and anything else, you know, that's where we are. But my sense is that frequently, not always, I'm sure you'll be able to come up with some counterexamples, but frequently uh, uh, the, 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 getting the Supreme Court involved nationalizes questions that need not have been nationalized. And that other one, and that or our ordinary politics will, will, would in fact leave uh, uh, at other levels. You know, we live in, in sort of extraordinary times in terms of American history when our wars are not equally shared uh, and are fought by really a very few people. Now, if that were to change, would it change our society, our, what we expect of our courts and, and our presidents? Would it change oh, access to abortion services if you're in the military? Would it change don't ask, don't tell? If, every, if we had conscription? Yes. Um, so one, one quite way of putting your question, I think, Nina, is, is whether, whether the culture wars are a real phenomenon or whether they're something that's generated by politicians. So there's this study by um, Morris Fiorino and a bunch of other people, uh, he's at the Hoover Institute, wrote a very good book called What Culture War? Uh, in which they argue that, in fact, if you look at polling data, um, America is not nearly as polarized as we've been led to think by the red state, blue state maps that we see every 
two or four years, uh, that yes, there are subtle, there, there are some differences, but they're differences of degree rather than kind on all of these issues, and they sort of fade, and there are a lot of purple states and so forth, but that because of the nature of national politics, politicians try to mobilize their bases and find wedge issues and so forth. Okay. Um, uh, but if they're wrong, right, if, it, if there really is this you know, deep cultural divide, then I take it one effect of mandatory national service is you would bring people together and they would uh, learn that the one who's you know, pro-choice, the other who's pro-life really have a lot in common and they could work together and you know, the, uh, or that you'd have greater racial integration because the military is the, the most successful site of racial integration in, in our country. Um, and and you know, I think you'd have some of that, but I, I guess I also tend to think that to the extent that the culture wars are real, uh, they're real even among people who live and work together. Let me ask some questions about religion. Uh, religion in the public square, religion, ex religious expressions, uh, s subsidies in one way or another for religion. Um, I think it's pretty well accepted that we have a court now that is considerably more accommodationist in its view is the technical term. That is accommodating, wishing to have religion more accommodated in the public square. Uh, and I, I would have to say as somebody who goes out and gives a lot of speeches that oddly enough, I don't get huge numbers of questions. When I talk, for example, bo before a high school audience about abortion or gay rights, I get questions about prayer, prayer in public school. Why can't we pray in public school? So. My other question I always get when I'm in a high school audience is whether the police have the right to search your vehicle <laughs> when they stop you for speeding. <laughs> Every time. You're going to different high schools. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I have a higher class of audience, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess let me ask you to uh, be a bit of a predictor on this. Um, do you think that we would, that it is? possible that we will have a return, if not to um, a moment of, of uh, non-denominational non prayer, at least a moment of silence as a permissible thing? Actually, the way I read Wallace versus Jaffrey is that a moment of silence is constitutional today, and, and they exist in many states, and I don't, I, I think we're there, I don't think people find them particularly satisfying. School prayer led by the teacher, I think not, I, I think that the answer to that is just no. Uh, I don't, I, I'm, my impression from leaders of the so-called religious right is that they don't even really believe in that. Uh, at least their legal arms don't tend not to believe in that anymore. It's really not a very good idea. Uh, and uh, from, from a religious person's point of view, it's not a very good idea, much less uh, uh, anyone else. I don't think it's, uh, uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's, it's a dead issue. So I always think that Justice O'Connor of all the uh, people in Washington is actually the most effective politician in the sense of this, that she always was able to put her finger kind of right where the middle was, and she had a good sense for where the country was. I don't, I assume, I don't think she's here anymore, but, but so she had this, and I think that her uh, establishment cl clause jurisprudence, which has been subject to much criticism for um, whether it was at, with, for its coherence, in some ways captures what the rough accommodation is right now, which is people are willing to give more uh, on religion questions. Uh, so I, I think that Judge McConnell's probably captured it well, although I will say there's still this huge divide. So I find my uh, students who are a pretty liberal bunch will say things about religious minorities that they would never say about any other major minority of any sort. Um, and, and they process the claims of religious minorities as an effort uh, to, um, uh, to enforce a pa you know, patriarchy on them, which is something they would also never say about almost any sort of minority. And so one of the things that's interesting to like, me... Like, can you give us an example? So, so students will basically, uh, they'll talk about the Christian right as if it's a monolith. They will talk about efforts to um, 
efforts for requesting for things like prayer in school or moments of silence, uh, not, they won't see them in any way as an effort by a minority group to do what every minority group does, which is fight about public symbols and public recognition. Um, and so there's, in some ways, this is, there's that divide, I think, still exists in an extreme way. And it's, it's, it's actually not the middle of America that's divided. It's sort of people who go to elite institutions like Yale Law School, where I think that that fight is still, is still quite salient. Yeah, I agree with Judge McConnell's legal analysis. I, I will say I, I have uh, two daughters. The older goes to a uh, public, el public elementary school. The younger daughter goes to a uh, religiously affiliated nursery school. And I feel like my older daughter is getting more religious. Like, that is, I, I never thought I'd say this, but, but I think there is a, a sense that there's a kind of weird secular religion in, in the public school. So for example, because they can't celebrate uh, any of the actual religious holidays that the students, various religious faiths, uh, celebrate, they, you know, they make a huge deal out of Halloween, right? Um, <laughs> which is, you know, this, this right, because that's, right, right, which I realize some people think, well, that's like a pagan holiday, but, you know, what, what basically for the kids is, well, it's just, you know, this is, you know, candy is like this biggest thing. So it's the <laughs> one day of the year my daughter doesn't have any homework so that she can go trick-or-treating, um, which just struck me as, as bizarre. And then, you know, they, my, my, the first grade, her first grade teacher cooks with them once a week, which is a very sweet thing. It teaches them math skills, planning, all these other things. But then before they eat, uh, she makes sure everyone has their thing, and then they, she says, bon appetit, now you may eat, which is sort of a cute phrase. And I realize, well, this is sort of a substitute for, for a little prayer or grace. And, 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 I, and I almost wish they would just say something like, let's be thankful uh, for this food, you know, without even specifying whom they're thankful to, um, <laughs> be, because, I, you know, it, this is, it's, it's a difference between what the law actually is, right, what the constitutional law actually is, and what people think it is, which is that you have to sort of purge all reference to prior religious traditions in some sense. And, that, and that, in that sense, I, I, I have some sympathy for the, quote, Christian right view of, of, of this uh, movement. And what about money for faith-based programs, as opposed to programs run by religious organizations but that remain secular in nature. Do um, you think the court is going to look favorably on that now? Um, I think the issue needs to be broken down into, into what, is, what is going to be the particular uh, thing that comes up. Uh, there's such a variety here. Faith-based faith organizations, of course, been major recipients of uh, of assistance for a long time. This is not a this is not a new thing. Uh, the the rules have been very inconsistent, with you know one department you know being you know much more exacting than another in terms of what kinds of secularization strings uh, uh, there are. Uh, so. Uh, will homeless feeding shelters have to remove the uh, religious posters from the wall or the crucifix from the hallway as you go into the church basement to get the to get your meals? Um, I mean, that would be a question. Uh, will religious organizations be required uh, not to staff themselves with their uh, their, their ministries with people in their own uh, uh, denomination if they receive uh, uh, money. Or I remember I, in my church in Washington, D.C. had um, one of the largest uh, homeless feeding programs uh, in the city, and it got large enough that uh, one set of regulators told us that we had to get a different kind of oven system that would comply with, you know, the, with the rules, and the, uh, and there was available a FEMA grant to help defray the cost of this because we didn't need it for their own church purposes, but then it turned out that if we accepted the FEMA money in order to comply with the regulations to feed the homeless, then our Wednesday night uh, church supper could not use that oven. <laughs> Uh, because that was because it was uh, you know it was a prayer group uh, meeting in connection with the dinner. Um, these are the sorts of things, and they just I don't think that you can generalize. My guess is that some is that there will be various uh, uh, cases involving you know questions of degree and um, 
and, and there won't be one sweeping uh, decision saying, you know, faith-based program's okay, faith-based program's not okay. It'll be, it's, this is a very complicated set of questions. You two agree? Do we, do we have a, a unanimous court on this? I, Saying that something's complicated usually yes, exactly. gets agreement from law professors. <laughs> right. I, also, I also think it actually, what uh, Judge McConnell describes actually sort of also captures a little bit of the style of where the court is going on some of these uh, cultural war issues. So what you see nowadays, and I don't know if it's an effect of how much pressure has been put on the court of late, but it reminds me of our discussion yesterday about a cocktail chatter, you had cocktail discussion. It's really the taxation, you know, taxation power mm -hmm. that you should be thinking about. Where the court um, has, I think, sort of engages in proxies uh, on these issues. So, in a lot of the really highly freighted issues nowadays, what you see the court doing is engage using uh, statutory construction instead of constitutional analysis to do constitutional analysis. And so, uh, I work a lot with the Voting Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act is this. I mean, it's sort of an American symbol, um, and embedded in are these really hard questions about race and politics, and the Supreme Court probably is not going to say that the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional next year when it gets the case, but it has, it is death by a thousand cuts. So what the Supreme Court does every year is it narrows it a little bit, tweaks it by statute, and the motivations for that narrowing are, are I suspect, constitutional, that is a particular vision of equal protection, or uh, in Hamdan, you know, many people sort of read that case, it was really a separation of powers case, but the court was doing it by interpreting a sort of ambiguous statute one way versus another. So I think that uh, uh, what you may see is the court on these highly freighted issues sort of doing it piece by piece, not issuing broad pronouncements. And, and Chief Justice Roberts seems to me kind of an interesting example because so far, he had, much to the chagrin of Justice Scalia, he really hasn't, uh, with the exception of the desegregation cases, overturned precedent uh, or even said he would vote to overturn precedent. What he's done is he's trimmed away and chopped away in a sort of way that's it's harder to get your troops rallied up about, excited about it. Um, it's actually harder to explain because it's much more technical. Um, so it's a little sort of a, it's a gentler approach by, by the court. And I don't know if Justice Roberts is something new and a sign that the pressure has become pretty intense or if it's just, uh, just Justice Roberts. Yeah, I think the funding cases are fundamentally complicated because of the following uh, intuitions, right? Um, I think everybody would share the intuition that the f neither the federal government nor the states, whether under the federal constitution or state principles of constitutional law, uh, can build a church, right? The state, you know, the, the, this is the state church. Uh, on the other hand, I think everyone would also agree that if there happens to be a fire at the church, the uh, fire department, which is locally funded, can go and put out that fire. Right? Uh, so you can provide certain kinds of direct services, but not other kinds. Uh, then the question is, well, what if somebody is, uh, you know, wants to attend a religiously affiliated school for firefighters, right? And so there are all these intermediate questions, right? Uh, and uh, at that point, right, you're just haggling over price, as the punchline to joke goes. You know, listening to this, I, I'm reminded of how much more complicated it's gotten in many regards, that when um, the school prayer case was originally announced, President Kennedy called uh, Archibald Cox and said, I'm having a press conference today, what do I say? And Ar Archie Cox once said to me that he said to the president, well, let me think about it. And he couldn't come up with a good thing to say. <laughs> and then he turned on the, the press conference and the president said something very astute, good, political, everything, you know, about how prayer is really for some, is something personal we do by ourselves. We don't want, I don't remember all the things he said, but it was, and he got away with it. Um, I'm not sure, you know, these, these issues have become more complicated now, and therefore presidents can't get away with it quite that easily. Um, and I'm, well, you were talking, Judge McConnell, earlier about freedom of speech, and I'm looking at uh, an internet pornography, kitty porn case, this term. Um, you know, lo there's lots on the internet these days. There are Viagra ads, there's child pornography, and until now, um, libel laws don't count for much because you can't sue a blogger for libel. They most of the time don't have anything to, for you to get from them, to seize from them. There are no assets. 
So I'm wondering if candidate were to run to change some of this, cleaning up the internet, protecting people from false charges on the internet, um, would it ring a bell with the public? Uh, would, uh, would that put, uh, uh, would the court back down if, if some candidate were to prevail on this? If this became an issue in a national campaign? What do you think? I'd actually like to think that the court wouldn't back down. I mean, I agree with you that it's a politically salient issue. I mean, just one of my colleagues uh, was looking at his email, and he said, I I've concluded from my email today that my sex life is very important, my credit rating is unimportant, and some of my colleagues are self-important. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so everyone, everyone has experienced uh, an Internet search that went awry, and suddenly what you thought were um, was one thing, you end up on an entirely different site. Uh, uh, so, so I think that everyone shares that question, but I think that the one the thing that's wonderful about the court, when it does engage in these issues, is that it looks at it at a level, different level of generality. And so it addresses questions that in some ways legislators just can't address because they're, they're talking about the concrete. So Clinton, the Clinton administration and the Communication Decency Act, the CDA, I, can't, I, I don't know enough about it, but I know of some. I suspect the Clinton administration wasn't really a big fan of the CDA. Um, but if you're President Clinton, are you, you're going to sign a bill with that included in it. Um, and then you may actually be quite pleased that the court, when it looks at it at a different level of generality and isn't just thinking about the concrete politics of it, but the First Amendment implications, you might actually be quite relieved when the court goes ahead and invalidates it for you. Um, and so I think that in some ways, this is one place where the court, I think, has a great ad comparative advantage because it, it, just by the way that issues are cast, it thinks of things at a different level of generality than presidents and legislatures do, and that's, that's quite useful. In the previous panel, the question came up of why didn't President Eisenhower lend moral support as opposed to sort of, you know, actual troops and, uh, you know, saying he agreed with what the, he, that he has to carry out the courts. I mean, why didn't he lend moral support to the principle announced in Brown? Uh, and I think that's an interesting historical question, but I think generally that's not the, that's not what courts are good for for politicians. Courts are good for at least two sorts of things. One is what Heather just described, which is that the, uh, there's some decision that you're going to make that's going to be unpopular, so you don't want to make it. So you make the opposite decision and hope the court will bail you out by invalidating what you've done and you sort of, you're secretly relieved. Uh, and the other thing that they're good for is for beating up on, right? So, you know, the court makes an unpopular decision, you can campaign against that court. And all, you know, in my memory, every president has done that on some set of issues, usually invoking the same sort of rhetoric, a rhetoric that goes back to President Roosevelt's fireside chat for the court packing scheme, right? The, yes, of course, I believe in judicial independence, but here they've gone too far. Here they're legislating from the bench. Uh, and that's, a, that's, that's what uh, you use the court for, is to, uh, it's, it can be sort of a whipping boy. Um, I wanted to say something about what Heather was talking about, the court being able to look at things from a different at a different level of generality. I think there's a lot to that. But another thing that courts are able to do uh, is uh, wait until the, con the passions and consensus of the moment have passed and to evaluate legislation down the road and in light of what it's how it's actually been uh, administered. And in this connection, I worry about uh, the tendency of many uh, organizations to file suit the next day, and for sometimes Congress even includes provisions in the statute waiving ordinary juris uh, 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 jurisdictional limitations so that you get quick review. Uh, and, and, and often the, you know, the, the court will a court will enjoin the statute before it can ever be uh, uh, put into place. I want to suggest that that's actually a mistake and that it would be, not always, there may be times when the, when the issues are really uh, uh, clear and that needs to be done, but often what happens is that the court ends up uh, affirming the constitutionality of somewhat dubious legislation because it has been passed in the full, first full flush of of uh, p popularity, and then you know, ten years later, when all the problems have come along, then they're stuck because of stare decisis and find it hard to, 
uh, uh, to deal with it. It seems to me there have been quite a few uh, examples of this. I wonder, you know, McCain Feingold is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is an example. And, and, and here, I think the court did a partial corrective when it said, well, the, that was a facial challenge where we upheld it. Now we are going to entertain uh, uh, as applied challenges to specific things. Whatever one thinks about the underlying decision, I think is a matter of sort of institutional practice. Uh, uh, that's good, but I'm also think you know as a as a sitting a judge, we hear all kinds of sentencing cases. The Sentencing Reform Act was passed with you know absolutely huge bipartisan support. Everybody you know uh, from uh, uh, Strom Thurmond to Teddy Kennedy thought it was a, a a great idea, and then there was an immediate challenge based upon the most obvious problem, which was a separation of powers problem, rejected in Mistretta. Uh, and uh, you know, and and then over time, now people now there is a great deal of belief that this wasn't such a hot uh, idea, and by the time the the court is ready to really seriously consider the way that it actually operates, they've already rejected the most obvious constitutional claim, and then they latch on to. Well, I may be getting too technical here, but they latch onto the jury trial right, the Sixth Amendment claim, which leads to a very strange uh, a decision, which is just tearing the the, the courts uh, apart. I mean, in a practical sense, it's just mystifying uh, decision because they held that the problem with the sentencing guidelines was that judges rather than juries are the ones finding key facts that determine how long the sentence is going to be. And then they said, and the, and the remedy to this is that now district judges have even more discretion than before to, uh, uh, and, and, the, and with no additional jury findings whatsoever. So it's a very strange uh, disconnect between their remedy and the supposed constitutional violation. I think that the, that the moral, one of the morals of this story is let's, the, if the court were less confident that it that it's going to get it right the first time out if it's a little bit it ought to wait and uh, go slow and get some experience and not go for these immediate uh, uh, sweeping uh, facial challenges but uh, uh, be a little bit more modest about the role and then I think maybe in the end they might even strike down a few more things but on a on a more focused, sensible, experience-based uh, uh, judgment about what their effects are going to be. I'm going to close out this panel with a, a kind of a broad question. Um, when Justice Scalia says that uh, we've taken that his opponents, in a particular case, have taken sides in the culture wars. Um, and others say, well, no matter how you decide, you're taking a position. And then I get a lot of questions here, the, the core of which it is, I thought the Supreme Court was supposed to protect minorities when their rights were being trampled, when they were not taken into consideration enough because they can't win in a democratic process. There are, by, by definition, minorities. Conversely, we believe that, by and large, this is a democracy and that difficult questions are supposed to be decided by our legislative and executive branches, the elected branches, not the appointed branches of government. And it seems to me that whenever I have a philosophical discussion at all with any judge, when they write something and I get to talk to them about it, it always comes down to that. So how do you reconcile those two views, each of you, and then we'll take a short break and come back for the next panel. Well, it can't be that minorities always win because they're minorities, and it also can't be that majorities always win because they're majorities, because we do, after all, have a constitution that limits majorities. You know. So I think it's kind of a silly dichotomy. What you have to do is you look you at the con- my question silly? <laughs> <laughs> Trust a lot, Professor, to resist the Only the dichotomy, okay? Okay, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, we have a constitution that 
guarantees minorities some rights and leaves other questions that might, minorities might care very deeply about uh, some things that aren't constitutionalized, where they don't have any constitutional protections. I think the courts ought to be paying a lot more attention to the document, that is to say the Constitution, along with its history and its history of interpretation and, the, and, uh, uh, and so forth, and less to the question of whether it's a minority or a majority that's, uh, uh, that's bringing the claim. They are, after all, in office as be, uh, in order to enforce the law, not in order to uh, to decide, you know, these issues that, you know, at least by my reading, the Constitution leaves to the people to decide, at least in some cases. Uh, so John Hart Ely actually had a famous book uh, in which he defended the role of the courts, and he said courts are supposed to do two things. One is they're supposed to protect minorities who can't protect themselves in a democracy, and two, they're supposed to clear the channels of political change. So he's thinking, of course, about one person, one vote, right? You can't actually have a democracy that works particularly well unless you make sure that everyone can cast an equal vote. And I think that that there's a perspective among voting rights scholars uh, that in some ways the mistake was to divide those two things and, and that to, to sort of, it doesn't quite remove the tension, but to, to imagine the role of the court in protecting minorities uh, is part of your role is clearing the channels for political change, that is to put minorities in a place where they can protect themselves. So the Voting Rights Act, I think, is the best example of that, and I think the most important civil rights legislation that's been passed, because unlike lots of other pieces of civil rights legislation, what the Voting Rights Act did was it put a bunch of black and Latino officials in place all over the country, and black and Latino officials were able to uh, use their power once they got in office and once they were embedded within a party to protect their own. So there's a great piece by Sam Azakoff and Pam Carlin that says that almost all the advances of African Americans in this country have mostly come in places like government hiring. Um, and, and those are places where, the, the reason why that is so is because that's a place where elected officials are actually able to exercise some power to help their own community. So it doesn't solve the problem. But I think that it's useful to imagine ways in which you can connect those, say, the, those two things so that it's not about protecting minorities so much as empowering minorities so that they can fight the good fight on behalf of themselves just like any other group does. Uh, much of our discussion on this panel has been devoted to the question of uh, whether judicially uh, mandated legal change is effective in the long term. Uh, if so, how effective, or is it counterproductive? And that's a long, long-standing debate. Uh, I think there are sometimes false assumptions in that debate, like the false assumption that uh, civil rights litigators uh, or civil rights organizations always run to the courts as the first thing that they do. I've done a lot of work with these organizations, and they almost always have a, have a legislative strategy that is dominant, but that they go to the courts because often that's not working, and they think they have a a legal claim. Uh, I do want to say something about um, how those claims develop. Uh, I fully agree that uh, as a practical matter and as a legal matter, not all minorities are going to uh, be successful, nor, nor should they be successful. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, but, but there, there's, a, there's a question of how you, how you get to the point where your social movement can be successful. So, you know, the, the movement for Women's rights in the 19th century was a fringe movement, right? We look back now upon the, you know, the the formative event, Seneca Falls, and so forth, and we think, well, that was, you know, that was. We're looking back on it because it was successful in the 20th century. In the same way that the movement for gay rights prior to uh, the 1960s and even well into the 80s was a fringe movement, right? It's become successful, and it only they only get any recognition by the courts after they've had some success in the political sphere. Uh, the question then of you know, the relation between that political social success and success in the courts is a very complicated one. I think that the dynamic is, goes back and forth. To some extent, courts can be catalysts, but they can also inspire backlash, and so it's very hard, hard to generalize about that. You might be tempted, I think, to conclude, therefore, that what happens in the courts doesn't really matter that much, because it's, it's just going to be a matter of timing, right? When do the people with the old views age out and they're no longer voting? Um, I, and I, I, I'm, but I'm reluctant to, 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 to say that. I, I, think, I, I think that uh, presidents uh, and voters in choosing presidents are right to think that um, 
who is on the Supreme Court matters. It's not the only thing that matters, uh, but that you know, when Gerald Ford said uh, shortly before his death that if it came to it, he would be willing to be judged solely on the strength of his appointment of Justice Stevens to the court, uh, he was not saying something that was absolutely crazy, right? That is to say that these people are there for a long time, what they decide matters, um, to some extent, they have a choice. To some extent, they feel they, they don't have a choice. Uh, but that, you know, for better or for worse, the Supreme Court is a powerful institution in American uh, political life, not as powerful as the presidency, but one that, you know, from time to time plays a, a very large role. Uh, and so it's not just some epiphenomenon on social movements. So I just want to have one other thing to say here, uh, leading into our next panel. Uh, in the lunch break, I was asked by a television interviewer why we should care about the presidential libraries. And I said, because they're a part of our DNA as much as a, our parents are a part of our DNA. They're a part of our national DNA and who we are. And that is never more clear than in the subject of executive power and the limits on executive power in wartime, which is the subject of the final panel of the day after we all have a short break to do whatever we have to do.